Hey guys, can you guess where I'm at? Yeah, it's not that hard because of course over my left shoulder is an entire collection of BMW 3 Series. I'm here in Munich at the BMW Museum and uh, did you know that about 600,000 people a year visit here, making it one of the most popular tourist attractions in Munich. And coming up right now, I had a chance to meet with the director and we're gonna give you a little personal tour of some of the coolest and most classic BMWs that you can find here in Munich. BMW uh, and what it stands for. So obviously Bayerische Motorwerk. Motorenwerke, yes. Yeah, that's the name of the company. And people are always confused about the logo, right? There's this confusion between it standing for a ro ro rotating prop or the colors of the various. So which one is it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, actually we have, um, if somebody cannot remember the name in German, yeah. BMW, we can call, we call it Blau mit Weiß, so we know where the blue is and where the white is. So it's blue with white. So it's not so a rotating it's, propeller. No, it is a rotating propeller, but uh, to, to have your, you know, if you, you so can remember blue. where the blue and where the white is, we say blue with white. So it's uh, actually re really, it uh, symbolizes uh, a propeller that turns with, with the two um, colors of the, sea, of the, of the um, sky, blue and white. Okay. And of course the Bavarian sky is blue and white. So it symbolizes three things basically. So it's it's the local colors, it's the colors of the sky, yes. it's a rotating propeller. Exactly. Okay. So the red one is basically one of the first ones from 1928. Um, that is the so-called Dixie. Um, there were numerous variations of that car, but this is basically what we started with. Um, and uh, you see it here. And the uh, 3 slash 15 stands basically also for the model and the horsepower. So it's a slash 50 means it has 15 horsepowers. And you asked for the number of the motorcycles before. There were, of course, we built a lot of motorcycles. With this car, we started roughly with 3,000 something cars. Okay. So it was a smaller start. And then in Eisenach, we, we started to build more and more cars and more and more models. And when we, once we walk through the museum, we will see more cars. is set up in houses and we don't have like a chronological order of like from 1916 to nowadays we um, show what is are the strengths and the core values of the company so for example here uh, it's motorsports and before we had lightweight and there's a house of design and one house of the brand um, like the, the um, model ranges. I'll show you that later on. So tell me about this car. This is a classic BMW race car. Superleggera. Superleggera, yeah. yeah super well, su Superleggera, of course, is the, um, um, if, you, if you come closer, you can see here that the Carrozzeria Touring Milano, here, uh, the outer shell basically was built in Milano. Um, underneath, it is a BMW 328, technical, technologically wise, but of course, um, then enhanced to be driven in the Mille Miglia. At that point of time, the most important car race in the world. Uh, 1,000 miles through Italy, from Brescia to Rome and back in three days. Um, we still do that nowadays. It's still a crazy trip and we still do it with the old cars. Um, we won the Mille Miglia in 1940, which was very prestigious for BMW. And this is only one example of the cars we used there. This is a closed version, like a coupe version, but we also drove there with roadsters. And um, if you look up there, 
There, that's the regular 328 that you see in the in the film, and there's one later down later on downstairs at the BMW Plaza. You see here that's basically the racing racing history that we have. We started off very quickly with racing with our cars. So tell me about the iconic kidney grill. Where did that come from? Did I stump you? <laughs> I, I, I don't know where the kidney grill comes from. Let me put it in other words. Um, I think what's very important is that very quickly in our history, and especially with the 328, you find all the elements that BMW was very famous for for a, lot of for a long time and that also our image is being built on. For example, lightweight construction, very sporty and dynamic, with a six-cylinder inline engine, and um, as you can see, like proportion-wise, you know, a long hood, our coupes uh, still have that, a long hood, uh, uh, a driver's seat that's very set back, and it gives you a very sporty uh, impression of the car already. So here's something very crazy in America. Um, for the longest time, the straight six was kind of the pinnacle of automotive engineering, right? It was yeah. uh, the most, smooth, it was kind of the technically most interesting, and right now there are only two straight sixes you can buy in America. Everything else has become a V6 because of packaging, right? It's easy yeah. to package. And one of the companies, of course, is BMW, still builds a straight six and sells it in America. And the other company is an American company called Cummins Diesel. Mm -hmm. So they put them in the big pickup truck. But those are the only two right now. And Mercedes just announced that they're bringing back the straight six. I know, yeah. Yeah, but there'll be three. Unlike many other museums, which are basically, let's face it, warehouses with a bunch of cars stacked up, the BMW Museum is designed around rooms that are themes. There's a motorsport room, there's a design room, efficiency room with the new i8 and i3, and of course this room, which is perhaps the heart of any BMW, and you know what this is. This is the engine or motor room, because of course BMW got its start building these airplane engines. Yeah. Um, by the way, that's the house of the engines, which okay. was just recently rebuilt and uh, refurbished to a new standard. We, we have a plug-in hybrid um, drivetrain in the middle, but you have all the engines uh, that are significant for BMW here. Like, we always use the internal abbreviations because the engines are usually famous for, that, for, for, for those names. So if you're an enthusiast, and you drive, uh, for example, like I do, um, the E20 from the 70s, you know that your car has an M20 engine mm -hmm. and not like you don't talk about the... Right, right. Uh, you, know the you know the internal designation. You, exactly, it. you know that. Yeah. And so these are some of the more classic engines out of, out of the different BMWs over the years. Ah, yeah. sorry. And speaking of the straight six. Yep. Yeah. How, you know, also this one, this one. This one, yeah. yeah. No, but also all, all the engines, see? And of course, I think these are airplane engines. They look yes. like they're too big to fit in. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see that here, you know, also there. Um, that is a boat engine. Oh, it is a boat engine. Yeah, our, our engines at that point of time were mainly built for airplanes, but then we also used them for, I don't know, you know um, engines in, uh, in farming, in building and everything. We have actually also an engine, a fire engine, where the pump is driven by a BMW engine. This is basically one of the most famous engines we have, the so-called uh, Sternmotor, a star engine, because it looks like a star. Yep. So it's, of course, clearly an airplane engine. So, so after the war, BMW was, I think, prohibited from building airplane engines. Is that right? Is that when you switched? Yeah, also, yeah, yeah. For, for a while, oh, and wow. also the, um, we were also not able to build cars for a while. Yeah. But we picked up in the 50s then. That was like when the Isetta was built. The Isetta, uh, the 501, 502, yeah, that's, yeah, that's how we small. picked it up. Exactly. And you still build uh, airplane engines? No. No. No, no, we have stopped it uh, a long time ago. So just motorcycles and cars? Yes. That's the Isetta. Yep, 
That was the car after the war, right? That's the car after the war. And very important not only for us, but also for the development of Germany after the war. Um, what we called was more or less the um, mobilization of the people, you know, like um, we had to get the mobile yeah, somehow so and all those small cars like the Isetta and the Messerschmitt, Kabinenroller, there are a lot of cars who s symbolize that, uh, that period where people got mobile again and uh, could pass the Alps and, you know, the big dream and everybody's talking about that still is in the 50s you bought the car and you took it over the Alps to the Mediterranean Sea. And that's where you spend for the first time in your life vacation on the beach. And all with that. If you drive a car like that today, it doesn't you're gonna, move. You're gonna get very hot. But sometimes there are like three, four people in there, like two adults, two children, no problem. And your feet are the crumples on. Yeah. <laughs> well, not very safe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's cool. And that is my favorite room in the museum. You asked about that before. Yes, because I think it's, just, it's like the sun, you know, it's bright, it's, it's, uh, it's cool. And also this side at least is my youth, you know, with the 2002 in orange. And uh, what I especially like about that is if you look around it, we incorporated pictures of customers. People who we asked when we reopened the museum to send us their pictures, their private pictures, and they, we got tons of them, of course. And you see, you know, what what the car was, or what the car looked like when they used it in their days. And the, every story here, every picture here has a story behind it. People, typical 70s pictures, you know. And it tells a story. You know, it's much better. Than, it's better than everything we could ever tell about those cars. Is that people tell their own story. The M1 is definitely one of my favorite cars. So when I was a young lad, this car was new when I was young. Yeah. I remember seeing Me too, it yeah. and thinking to myself, you know, this is the car of the future. It was so, now it looks, of course, just classic, but back then it looked futuristic. It looked like something that, you know, was designed in outer space and not in real life. And you saw it going down the Autobahn and you were just, it was breathtaking. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, um, orange. And we just, uh, you know, this year it's um, 40 years of M1. Mm -hmm. And now in our workshop, you know, that we at BMW Classic, we have a workshop where we restore cars for our customers. We have several M1s just there, and we just restored one with 7,000 original kilometers. And it's just amazing. You see that beauty standing there in the workshop every day, and those colleagues, they dive into the engine and rebuild it, and afterwards it's better than you, that's just great. That is the C3 um, M Roadster. Then you, behind you, you have a very special model. It's the E46 um, M3 CSL. So also a lightweight version of that one with a little more horsepower, but also it's just um, better handling, a little more output, power output, uh, lightweight construction almost not to find anymore nowadays. Nobody it's, will sell it. It's funny, a lot of these cars didn't actually come to America, you know? Uh, initially BMW uh, brought their 3 Series, but not the, not the, like the first M car that came to America, yeah. I think was uh, down about 50 horsepower, the first 3 Series that came. Really? Yeah, the first M3. And then finally BMW matched the horsepower. And I don't know what the thinking was, why? We got less power than, than the Germans. Maybe they figured we didn't have autobahns, so we don't need 300 horsepower. If you um, if we go to the left, yep. just quickly, you see the picture of the Elvis car that we restored, before and uh, after. before and after. Yeah. And you still see your license plate, one of those uh, was, still, was on it, but it's, um, of course, not the original one that the Elvis had, but you see what the car looked like when we got it. It was basically destroyed. Yeah. And then we rebuilt it as new. A true bar find. A true, well, not bar find. It belonged to uh, uh, a man in California. We talked to him for years, and he had a huge car collection, and. 
Finally, he at decided. one point he said, "Yes, yes. let's do that." And then is that, see. Is that car here still? Is it here in the museum? Uh, we have to see. It was here until yeah. uh, two days ago, but we're in the middle of um, changing, changing, changing the exhibition. Is not that? It's still there, and then we have, can look at have a look at it. This is Elvis's 507. I thought his was red. What happened? Now it's white. Well, when we got it, it was red, but that's the original color. It is white, but Elvis had it repainted in red. You know why? No, why? Because all the lipstick marks were on the car. <laughs> so he was stationed in Germany. Yeah. And um, of course, the women loved him. So they would use their telephone numbers and kisses, everything on that car. And he was, after a while, that was enough. So he said, you know what, just paint it red for me. And we painted it like, I don't know whether we did it, but somebody painted it red for him. And that's what the car was in, in that color for a long time. But the car was also sold by, him, by, um, by Elvis then to a race car driver, Hans Stuck in Germany who raced it also on Nürburgring and other races and get, got, went through numerous hands afterwards and then we found it back in um, California. Okay. You can put a seatbelt on and not, not have to worry about a helmet. Look, it's got a little sunroof. <laughs> it does actually. And you could, I think you could fall on them, right? And you wouldn't get hurt. So you just, Exactly, but you have to keep your legs in. So yeah. um, what people who owned that were taught is if you, like, if you stand at a, at a light, for example, yeah. and you fall over, always keep your feet on the pedal, because uh, otherwise, if you step down and it falls on you, it squishes you. So oh, just fall like that, no problem. You can stand up again afterwards. The problem with that motorcycle is people ride motorcycles because they're dangerous, yeah. right? <laughs> and so I think the reason that never, you know, there's not, never a C2 was because people want that sense of danger and sense of like, uh, you know, hair messed up by the wind, right? Yeah. Well, I, I don't think uh, it was considered really as a motorcycle. It was more like scooter. urban mobility scooter. Yeah. And the concept, perhaps we were a little early, uh, the concept is very, very, um, sought after today. A lot of people say, you know, why can't we have uh, something like that again? And uh, who knows, something like that might come again, because if you look at uh, the needs that we have towards urban mobility nowadays, that could work again. So, so do you know how, what the difference is between a motorcycle and a scooter? Um, how you define them? I think it's more, it's, I think it's more like a perspective that you have on that. No, you know? no, no, there's a real difference. So the difference between a motorcycle and a scooter is if you can pass your feet through it, it's a scooter. Yeah. And if you have to step over it, it's a motorcycle. Really? Yeah, that's the I difference. Didn't, I don't drive motorcycles, so I don't yeah, know that. That's the difference. So I think, scooters, you can just, you know. I think I already made the mistake. I don't drive, I ride a motorcycle, motorcycle right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's keep going. And with the five series, we start those three digit numbers. You know, I really miss the old nomenclature of BMW and even Mercedes and some of the other German manufacturers. So once upon a time, obviously, a 320i was a 3 Series with a 2-liter fuel-injected engine, right? Or a 320iX was a 3-liter, 3 Series 2. Point eight year. Yeah, that yeah. was all-wheel drive. Yeah. Now, you know, it's all, it's all, you know, a 325 doesn't have a 2.5-liter. No. And that now is the house of the 3 Series. Uh -huh. That is basically, we call that the O2 um, series. That is a 1600 slash O2. And um, that is the predecessor of the three series. It was also very agile, very, very quick car. And with this one, we had a very strong market entry in the US market, which was then followed by all those models that you see here. From the, e, uh, I give you the internal right. digits, uh, uh, internal numbers. We use that's that in the classic right. division. The E21, the E30, E36, E46, and E90. After that, the E90. Uh, after the E90, there came the um, the F30, which is um, still on the road today. I think back, especially in the 80s and 90s, when people in America were still buying sedans. Right now, everything is, of course, a crossover. Yeah. Um, I think the 3 Series represented the vast majority of cars that BMW would sell. So BMW, of course, had the 3, the 5, the 7, yeah. uh, the 6, but most people would buy the 3, and the 3 was kind of the benchmark for 
the mid-sized sedan in America for you know, two decades, maybe longer. Yeah, that, that is true. Um, the 3 Series was very important image-wise in the US for us. It stands for, for the core BMW values with driving dynamics. Um, but also 5 Series. 5 Series, we sold a lot of 5 Series and still sell a lot of 5 Series in the US. Uh, and even 7 Series. The US is a very strong market for the 7 Series. All right, so which is your favorite gear? Which one do you, internal? You like this one? This one, E46. Yeah. I own one. Okay. <laughs> so that is my favorite. And uh, you see the golden one, the E21. I own one of these too because I just love the shape of it. Oh, it was my beautiful. first car. Yeah, and I love the way the hood opens, right? Yeah. It kind of slides forward exactly. and goes like backwards. It's really cool. Yeah. Well, those two are my favorites. I also like the E30, especially the convertible. You see the white one there? Yeah. That's a beautiful car. So you have these cars, so you collect cars as well? Well, I don't collect. Uh, I have two cars. Okay. Uh, those two, those, those are, are my two cars. cars. Yeah. Okay, those are your two cars. <laughs> and, uh, is this one your daily driver? Um, no, no, no. I, I, you have a company car. I have a company car, but um, I have a convertible. Yeah. So I take it, I take it out, out as often as I can, even in winter. With the development, with a few models in the 1970s, then the 80s, 90, 2000, 2010, if you see the increase in um, the increase of models we offer to our customers. Like we were saying, once upon a time there were basically four cars, four models you can get a BMW. Cool. And yeah. now it's like probably two dozen. Yeah, I mean in the 70s it was four, yeah. four yeah. models. And now look at that, that's incredible. Yeah, but on the other hand, that's also something that uh, customers demand. Yeah. Timothy Dalton was before, okay. and uh, there was Piers Brosnan. Oh, Piers Brosnan, that's right. Exactly. There was also a 7 Series, I remember. Yes, uh, yeah. that's not here on display, but we still have it. Oh, so the one that drove this? autonomously, you yeah, remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. We did that already in the 90s. Yeah. So well, well, <laughs> autonomous before, driving. Long well before it became in vogue. So yeah. were these actually the James Bond cars? Was this the one that was driven by? Those are the original James Bond cars, yes. Okay. You can see, still see the license plate. Oh, it is a British flight, isn't it? Yeah, but still it's uh, left hand drive, so yeah. Um, but there are more versions of this car. There's, um, of course, some have the more features. Yes. Of course, movie cars, there's always more than one. Yeah, that, that is the um, second room underneath the other one for the design. And um, we talked about, about the BMW Vision Efficient Dynamics before, which is actually the predecessor of the i8. We presented this car and Im immediately it was clear we had to build this car and the, um, the desire was to change as little as possible. And if you look at the car now uh, as it is here, uh, you can see that the i8 incorporates mm, almost everything and we just had to yeah, close some of the door parts and of course the windshield couldn't stay like that, but yeah, and the, and all the rest. Always love like huge wheels, which are never practical. And they always love like, like weird um, rear view mirrors, right? <laughs> this is a beautiful car. That's one of the other uh, models yeah. from the Millimilia. I don't know what the, um, what's the English word for that? The Millimilia? No, the, the, that's Kantenhaube. Uh, um, no, Bügelfalte. You know, it's a Bügelfalte, you have trousers with that. With oh, the crease. Like, you know, yeah, that's no, what that's we crease, call that okay. here, too. Oh, yeah. okay. I see. Yeah, those were, those were um, quite the races. Yeah, and uh, I, of course, uh, already had the chance to drive cars like that. Yeah. It's incredible. You, how have you driven one like this? That one. And what's it like? It is still very enjoyable. Yeah. It's fast because it's very lightweight. Although it's not very powerful to the nowadays standards, it only has 130 horsepower, but uh, it's very light. And um, the only problem we have with these cars is braking. Yeah, I was going to say the brakes yeah. are probably terrifying. <laughs> yeah, and of course, no, no electronic system whatsoever. So in rain or slippery conditions. No stability control, no ABS. 
No ABS. You're, you're the ABS then. And no airbag. You no have airbag. Big corners to drive it fast. And if uh, if you look 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 at the car and look at like my size, if I'm if I sit in the car, basically all that's up above here is above the car. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were, um, they were brave men who drove these cars fast. They're still brave men today, because yeah. as I said, those cars are still being driven in the Mille Miglia. And although it's nowadays that they do the Mille Miglia, they still drive fast. Yeah, so, so, so the Mille Miglia obviously was this very famous Italian race that took uh, racing, street racing, right, to the next level. Uh, and it, was, uh, it ended because there was a horrific crash. Right, spectators were killed, the car went off and killed a bunch of spectators, that was the end of it. And today they still do it, BMW does it, Mercedes does it, and they have police officers that go yeah. ahead of you uh, and basically allow you to drive faster than the speed limit. Let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> but um, yes. I think the, the, the important point is, compared to any other race that you have, which is on a racetrack, that those races are really done on streets yeah. in normal traffic. Yeah. The, all the other cars are still around. Yeah. You have to overtake, you have to go through the towns, you have to really be uh, very attentive on what's going on around you. Dogs, chickens, anything. anything. Yeah. Right. And by the way, on the other side is yeah. one of the most iconic cars, at least yeah. to my perspective. That is the 3 liter CSI, uh, or is it a CSL? Let's have a look. That is CSI. Um, there's also a lightweight construction, and uh, the racing version of the lightweight construction um, was also very famous in the US. So the CSI means it was fuel injected? Yes. yes. There's a CS, there's a CSI, and a CSL. What does the L stand for? Lightweight. Lightweight, okay. Is there IL? And no. <laughs> well, it is an IL, but uh, it's just CSL. Yeah. BMW 3.0 for us. Yeah, that's gorgeous. Well, thank you very much for this You're personal welcome. tour of the BMW Museum. And I'm hoping that uh, this is just the first of many episodes of this series, because I'm sure our viewers would love to get to know more about the historical cars of BMW. Yeah. Because you said you have 1,400, and we've probably seen, what, 50? Probably. Yeah. yeah. A lot more. A lot more. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Well, there you have it, guys, your own personal tour of this classic German BMW museum. Now, just across the street is BMW World, where you can pick up your new BMW if you order it European delivery. And that is one of the coolest BMW dealerships I have ever seen, but that is probably a video for another day. So as always, this is Roman saying thanks for watching. Remember, check out tflcar.com for more news, views, and of course, BMW Museum personalized tours. And, yep, it's as American as it gets. Elvis's 507. There it is, right there. Really, women used to kiss that thing because they loved Elvis? I am in the wrong line of work. I should be doing some music, but I can't sing, so probably a good thing. See you guys next time, ciao. That is a 700, that was a car that's essential for us. Uh, that is not very known anymore, but um, what a lot of people have forgotten until now that BMW was in a kind of crisis in the end 50s and that um, in the end 50s with the 502, 501, with the Isetta that everybody knows, we'll see that later, um, and the 507, the Elvis car. Beautiful cars, but uh, commercially not very successful. But we had the 700 also then in the um, 60s and uh, this car basically was part of the process where we grew again, we got a successful again, and then of course with the Neue Klasse, with the predecessor of the O2 series that we saw before, or the, the bigger version of the O2 series. Um, that's where we gained speed again and became commercially very successful.